Today, I'm going to be bouncing all over the scriptures, I'm afraid. So, if you have your Bibles, try to keep up. We're mostly going to be in the New Testament. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I'll just listen. Same. I'll just listen. That's what I usually do. Yeah, I'm very slow when it comes to catching up. Yes, I agree. I was taught growing up that there is a certain pattern of salvation, that the Bible teaches a way in which we are saved, and we're all saved the same way. And I... When I read the scripture, I often, uh, I often take things that are simple and make them more complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely one of those things. Because growing up, there is a pattern in the New Testament. And you can see it throughout the book of Acts, starting in Acts chapter 2, 14 through 47, if you're really curious. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. And you'll see this pattern that when people hear the gospel, they hear it, and the next thing is they believe it. When they believe it, it brings them to repentance. <clears throat> they confess that Jesus is the Christ, and then they're baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of their sins. At this point, they are saved and they receive the Holy Spirit. And this is the pattern that I was taught. And there's no shortage of passages that show this exact pattern. You have Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 47. Also, chapter 8, verses 5 through 13 and 35 through 39. Chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 16. Acts is full of, of examples that follow this exact formula. But does that example mean that there's an exact formula to salvation? We know from Paul's writing that we're all saved through Christ's death and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, verse 10, he writes, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In 2 Corinthians, he writes to that church, And Christ died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. So Christ's death covers all of us, but it also brings about a transformation because we know about it. In Galatians 5.13, Paul writes as well, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. So Paul has summed up that Christ's death and resurrection is not only salvation, it not only covers our sins, but it transforms our lives in the way of the golden rule, right? We dedicate ourselves to the Lord and to one another. And that is really what salvation is to bring about. That is the goal of salvation, that we live transformed lives. But the pattern always leads to baptism. Paul addresses this too in Romans chapter 10, or sorry, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, he writes, Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? When we're baptized, we are buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. Now, when you hear these words, are you thinking of heaven? Is that, is that the only thing that we're saved for? Are we only saved for heaven? Because this is the same passage where he tells us that we are no longer to live for ourselves, but live for one another. He goes on, For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, 
we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. That covers you through eternity. And it doesn't start when we die. It starts the day that we receive the Holy Spirit. But my question as I was researching this is, but what about baptism? Does salvation start at baptism? And I can't help but notice that Paul's language here in Romans is, um, it's a comparison. He's comparing baptism to crucifixion. He's not saying, that these are literally the same. He's saying they're figuratively the same. And he's saying also that when we die in a death like his, that we are reborn in a life like his, which is why a lot of churches consider baptism the ordinary way in which we are saved. This language is used in several confessionals used by denominational churches that baptism is the ordinary way in which salvation occurs. But a lot of churches posit that it's not the only way. In fact, there are exceptional cases, that there's ordinary cases basically implies there must be exceptional cases, right? So here's a few that we find in Scripture. We know that there are some who express belief in Jesus but lack the capacity to be baptized, typically because of age, disability, or circumstance. Those who are disposed to be baptized but are unable, such as the thief on the cross, and those who are martyred because of the cause of Christ. They may or not have been baptized, but several churches use the language that because they're martyred, because they die in a death like Christ, that they are baptized by blood. And so, even though we have this ordinary way in which people are saved, in which they hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, even though we have that ordinary way, there are still exceptions. Because, as, as Paul tells us, and I have gotten my notes out of order, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, that it is by faith, sorry, by grace through faith that we are saved, not by works. And baptism is something we do. Well, there is nothing we can do to merit salvation. There is no good work we can do that is so good that it will earn us an eternity in heaven. But of course, if there's nothing so good that will earn us an eternity in heaven, I want you to have hope. There's also nothing so evil as to merit an eternity in hell. I believe the exceptions are more than the ordinary. Because Paul tells us we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one can boast. For we are his creative work having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we can do them. So we can do them. You'll notice that's the same language he uses to talk to, I believe it's the Romans. No, the Galatians. <laughs> yes. Sometimes sermons need redactions. Sorry. <laughs> that God has prepared us these good works that we serve one another. He tells the same things to the Ephesians. So if baptism isn't the moment of salvation it's itself, what is it? If you turn to Luke chapter 13, 
Jesus gives us a parable. And he says, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Notice that language. He says she hid it in the flour. She didn't knead the yeast through the flour. She didn't do anything. She just kind of hides it in the flour. That's a weird way of putting it, isn't it? If you put yeast into some dough and just leave it sitting, <clears throat> what's going to happen to the dough? Well, it turns out if you leave it in the dough, it will leaven eventually. Really? Eventually. Give it long enough, yeast is alive and it moves. That's why your dough bubbles. Oh, Maybe I just don't want to imagine them <laughs> <laughs> Well, the word, of, the word of God is alive too, and it moves through the dough. So let's say this woman hides the yeast, the word of God, at one end of the dough. Mm. What happens if you just let the dough sit, and later you come back and take another piece of dough, and you cook that piece? Is it going to be leavened? No. no. Probably not, but maybe it will. That, that yeast is going to move. And if you let it sit long enough, well, if you let it sit long enough, it'll become beer. <laughs> oh, wow. yeah, what? So, yeah, if you just pull a piece off of that dough, it might be leavened. But you won't know until you put it in the oven. That's the point. And that's the point of the parable. You see... When we hear the word of God, we might be saved. If we're on that end that got the yeast, but what if we're at the other end of the dough? We don't know until the moment of baptism. Until the dough goes into the oven, we don't know if it's going to rise or not. Hmm. And just like, a, just like a souffle, you don't know until it comes out of the oven if it's going to rise or collapse. Hmm. If you can't tell, I am completely rejecting um, the Calvinist idea, once saved, always saved. Because the dough can do a lot of things. It has free will. We're the dough. We have free will. We can come to God, or we cannot. We can fall away. We don't really know whether or not we are saved until we are baptized. So I posit to you, that baptism isn't necessarily the moment of salvation. There are exceptional cases after all. But it is the moment at which our salvation becomes sure. The moment at which we know that we are saved. Jesus uses parables a lot to teach. And he does this because you can, gain, you can glean a lot of different meanings from parables. I don't know if he meant for this parable to be used this way, but here's one meaning that you can take away from it. There are other meanings you can take away from it, but I'm not talking about the parable today. I just want to use it as a metaphor for baptism. Now, I was taught that baptism was the moment of salvation due to a very literal reading of the word due to a very literal reading of all those moments in the books, in the book of Acts and the book of Galatians. But I want to address one more thing about it before you go and become a little too literally minded and think, oh, it has to be exactly this way. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But let's look to the words of Peter, Paul, and Matthew for some guidance. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Well, I won't go over this because I want to put it on YouTube and it mentions circumcision. Ooh. But he compares it to the covenant of circumcision. He compares <laughs> baptism to the covenant of circumcision. And if circumcision is a covenant, so is baptism. And it's not the covenant itself. It's the sign of the covenant. The covenant is given before the sign. 
but the sign is the proof. It's the signature on the page. You don't have a contract unless there's a signature on it. But guess what? You can sign that contract any day of the week. It's in your hands. What happens if you just sign it later? Well, now you have a contract. God has put the contract in our hands. He has given us the covenant, and whether or not we sign it, whether or not we're baptized, God will be faithful to us. Peter simile, similarly uses symbolic language to describe baptism. He talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he compares it to the flood. He says that in the days of Noah, as an ark was being constructed, in the ark few, that is eight souls, were delivered through water. <clears throat> and this prefigured baptism, which now saves you, not the washing off of physical dirt, but the pledge of a good conscience to God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who went into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers subject to him. Peter also uses symbolic language to describe baptism, and he uses it describing yet another covenant of God with the world. God made a covenant with Noah after he left the ark and put the rainbow in the, sign, in the sky as a sign of the covenant. Lastly, Matthew sets up a, well, in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 28, Jesus sets up a covenant directly with each and every one of us. He says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the only place in which we have an actual commandment to be baptized. And it's set up in the form of a covenant. So this is our covenant with God. He has set up the sacrifice in the, in the terms of his son, Jesus, going to the cross, dying for our sins, being that sacrifice that proves God's love and that God will uphold his end of the covenant. And all he asks of us is to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I had a hard time researching this because I really wanted to say, you know, these are all the things we must do. But I couldn't find it in the scripture. And so I, I ended up rewriting my whole sermon. What? Because... When I come to the Bible and I say, this is how it must be, and the Bible says, nuh-uh, guess what? The Bible's the authority on it, not me. I have a question. Hold on to it. So this is, this is how we are to, to be with Scripture. We take our questions to the Word, we read it in the Spirit, and we ask God to put it on our hearts. And if we find out we're wrong, guess what? I'll put it online. I'll scream it from the rooftops. I was wrong. And I'll tell you which passages to look at and tell you now go to your Bibles and do the same. And if I'm still wrong, you let me know. And I'll shout it from the rooftops again in Jesus' name. <laughs>